is an assistant professor at OSU's Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, uh, working with Coons here at Hatfield. He has his BA from Boston University and his PhD from the University of California in Davis. Um, but basically, from what I can figure out, from the very beginning, doing commercial shark fisheries observer program or designing experimental gear or doing tagging programs, pretty much the shark guy has been working on sharks. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I'm excited to hear what he has to say. It sounds like he's going to talk to us a little bit about the white shark and some of the work that he's been doing. And so if you guys can welcome Taylor. Thank you, Cinnamon, and thanks everybody for being here and everybody online. Cinnamon, I'm looking at the ceiling too when I'm talking. <laughs> um, but I uh, appreciate you guys all being here, and some of you may have been around this summer. Um, I gave a talk um, that was a sort of a broad overview of the research that I've done um, on white sharks and some salmon sharks and some other things. And so today I wanted to take this opportunity to get a little bit more focused about the um, different parts of the white shark than I was able to really focus on before, and a little bit how that leads into some of the research that I'm uh, planning to do here. Um, I also want to uh, recognize this, that this work I do isn't in a vacuum. It's a, it's a big collaboration, so I want to recognize some of my uh, collaborators, uh, especially Stanford University, Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, and the Dyer Island Conservation Trust in South Africa, and Mur Murdoch University in Australia. So. Um, Sharks have this persona, especially white sharks, and the idea that, that this is everything about them, that they are these giant teeth, and they are going around eating everything that's out there. Um, they're jumping out of the water, just basically creating havoc to anyone and anything near the ocean. Um, and my goal is to, to talk about sharks in a way that changes that mantra, changes that persona, to one that we appreciate how dynamic and interesting and complex these animals are and how important they are to the health of our marine systems. And also the truth about it in that, yes, they are predators, but they are not as dangerous as they're made out to be. In fact, you're a lot more likely to die from a selfie than you are from a white shark. <laughs> so um, just to get into a little bit of background um, about white sharks, um, there are six known genetically distinct populations of white sharks globally. Um, there's the uh, population in the Northwest Atlantic, uh, so that's off the coast of New England all the way down to Florida, I guess Nova Scotia all the way down to Florida, um, South Africa, population in Australia and New Zealand, um, the Mediterranean, the Northwest Pacific, sort of off Japan, and then the Northeast Pacific. Um, I, I put the, the two that are in blue are the Mediterranean and the Northwest Pacific because those are the two populations that we know the least about. And today I'll be talking mostly about the population in uh, the Northeast Pacific. So that, that basically is from Washington down to Mexico um, and then some of my work in South Africa. A little bit more background about them. Um, they are, white sharks are born at about 1.2 to 1.5 meters. Um, and they're free swimming, but there's no parental care. Uh, the litter size for a female is anywhere between three to 14 animals. We think it averages about eight. Um, but I put a question mark next to this because this is one of those, those basic facts, those characteristics of these animals that we still don't really have a great handle on. We don't know if that, uh, if that litter size changes with the, the quality of the, of the female, if they get, as the females get older and larger, if there's um, more pups produced or, or how that really varies. They're regional endotherms, and this is probably the coolest thing about white sharks, is that they're able to elevate their body temperature. So they heat their eyes, their brains, um, and their, their viscera. And so they're able to basically be a dynamic predator in really cold water. So if you are chasing down a, a seal or a sea lion, another um, endothermic, really agile animal in cold water, you need to be really agile as well. So white sharks have this, this, this regional endothermy that allows them to exploit animals in that really cold environment. They have this ontogenetic shift somewhere about two to two and a half meters long. And what that is is that when they're, when they're born, they are, um, they're born into warm water. Usually, I'm, I'm going to talk sort of about uh, the Northeast Pacific, um, I guess, when I give some of these examples. But... Um, they're, they're born in the Southern California Bight, so basically from Santa, Santa Barbara down south to Bahia Vizcaino down in Baja, California. 
Uh, and when they're born, they are eating um, other teleos, they're eating melasmobranchs, cephalopods, crustaceans, um, things like that. And they're limited, thermally limited, by that endothermy and their body size. Um, and so when they hit about two and a half meters, they, their dentition changes. So they go from uh, a type of dentition that's, that's focused on um, uh, fish, basically fish and lasmobranch prey, to one that's focused on those, those really triangular teeth, the serrated triangular teeth that we think about, that's focused on marine mammals. They also have enough thermal inertia that they can start moving into the colder northern waters. So it's a big transition for them um, at that ontogenetic shift. And this is the point that they become mostly available for the research that I'm going to talk about today. So when I talk about um, white sharks, I'm just assuming that they are um, animals from about 2.7 meters and above. Because those are the ones that are available for the type of research that I do, which is utilizing their, their predatory behavior on marine mammals. Their gestation is somewhere between 12 and 18 months. Again, we're not quite sure about it. We use different ways to infer that, but that's our best guess. In the populations, um, in all these different global sites, the uh, abundance is somewhere um, in the hundreds up to low thousands of individuals at each of these different um, locations. Their maximum age is somewhere at least 70 years, and this is recent. Um, about five years ago, you could have asked, and I would have told you it's about 35 years. So again, this is something that's, that's constantly updating as we get better and better techniques. Uh, and they make these really big, large-scale um, migrations. And this is a, an example of the, the migration that they make off of, um, off of our coast. And you'll see that there's the, uh, the part of the population that starts in central California and another part starts down in Guadalupe in Mexico. And they head out um, offshore and they go to this spot that's it's basically in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we call that the White Shark Cafe. Um, and we call it the cafe for two, or I guess for for the reason that we, we don't really know why they're going out there, but we came up with two, I guess, um, reasons why they might be doing that. One is that they're going out there to find a, uh, something to eat. There's some better foraging that's happening out there, or they're going out there to mate. So we call it a cafe because it's a spot you could go to meet somebody special, or you can go have a, a bite to eat. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that today. That's as much as I'm talking about the cafe. I want to take us back to the coast and talk about some of the really cool uh, behaviors and um, foraging ecology that the animals do when they're on the coast. And so these are the field sites that I'll be talking about um, today. The first on the left is California. Um, right in the middle of that circle is San Francisco. And the three spots that we hit, one is Tomales Point, the northern part of that, um, that little uh, outset. Um, the Farallon Islands, which is about 25 miles off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and then Año Nuevo, which is just north of Santa Cruz. And it lies about uh, a couple hundred meters off of the coast. So very close. Um, and these have uh, different aggregations of marine mammals. Um, there's elephant seals and sea lions at the Fairlawns um, and at Año Nuevo, and mostly uh, harbor seals up at, um, at Tomales Point. And then on the right side is South Africa. Um, and this is the work uh, I do down in, in Kansbai, which is a little bit south of Cape Town. Um, and you probably some of you may be familiar if you've ever watched the show on Discovery about Shark Alley. So this is Shark Alley between Giza Rock and Dyer Island. And so we use a little bit different methods to study the sharks at the different locations in South Africa. Um, we do a lot of chumming. So this is where you macerate a bunch of fish guts and you throw it in the water and you're coaxing animals in from all over the place and you throw in a, a, a buoy ball that has a bunch of tuna heads or some type of heads on it in order to, to bring the shark close to you. And that allows us to uh, basically get it to, to do a behavior that we want to, in, in order to tag it. Um, so you get pretty nice conditions. This is one of the biologging tags that I'll show in a little bit, trying to get the shark close enough for the boat to put to tag in. California, it's a little bit different. Um, we use decoys to attract the animals. We don't put big, um, big slurries of, of, um, of baits or anything in the water. We use a small piece of marine mammal bait um, and a decoy, and we try to coax the animal close to the boat. And once they get close, um, we do photo IDs, electronic tags, which we'll talk about. Um, and some biopsies for some of the genetic work. And so the you know the, the the first question is well what are the what do we know about the sharks and what is it that they're doing here and this is it's pretty obvious from um, from seeing them around is that they're here to feed uh, and this is a shark at the Farallon Islands feeding on a uh, an elephant seal 
I put this picture in for two reasons. I know before I said I'm trying to change that mantra of like fear and, and apprehension about sharks. But I also want to remind myself to make sure that I remind you that white sharks are predators. They are absolutely designed to kill and eat their prey. But that being said, they're designed to do it to their prey. It very rarely happens to us. But I also want to remind people that they're, you would never go and try to ride on top of a tiger <laughs> or put a grizzly bear inside your car to take a photo of it. So um, to when I think some of the some of the public discussion about um, about sharks and that they're not dangerous and um, you can swim with them freely and all these other things. Uh, I think that's not necessarily sending the right message. So I want to be very clear that I'm I surf all the time and I'm not afraid to surf and get in the water, but I'm not going to go hang on the back of a shark um, the same way that I would not do that to a, a tiger. So we do know that they're, they're feeding extensively when they come to the coast. Um, and we do this by looking at the, the body condition of the animals when they arrive and then later on through the season. So this is a, a shark we call Mr. Burns. He's about 16 feet long. Um, and this is him about a month later. And if you compare so the, the height of that dorsal fin, which is a static size, to, um, to the, uh, his girth, basically, you can get an estimate of, of his body condition change. And so over that month, you can see how much that animal changed during that period, which is pretty incredible. And if we do that with a bunch of different animals, we see that all of the animals that we have on the coast, if we look at them for at least three weeks, or at least a three-week gap from when they got there, um, so when we took the next photo, is that all of them increase in their general girth. So we know that they're coming in. We know that they're basically bulking up on their food. From some of the genetic analysis that, or sorry, some of the isotopic analysis analyses that we've done, um, we've also seen that the majority of their feeding happens on the coast. And so about 50% uh, more feeding occurs on the coast than does any other time during their um, seasonal migration. So that whole time, basically, they're swimming out to the cafe and coming back. They're eating very little compared to the few months that they spend on the coast. So we were interested in looking at some of the foraging behavior while they're at the coast. And historically, our understanding of how a white shark feeds comes from these opportunistic sightings or these bait attractions at the surface. And so I'm sure all of you have seen the videos of sharks jumping out of the water, or sharks eating a seal, sort of like the one I just showed a few minutes ago, where um, we describe their, their foraging, their feeding behavior as this ambush predatory um, event, and uh, that's what sharks do. The truth is that we're looking at such a small, minuscule piece of their lifetime, or of their, their, even their daily life, um, to try to extrapolate that out is very difficult. So it's like seeing you go to get coffee in the morning, watching you for a few seconds and saying, I know exactly what you're going to do all day like based on those first few seconds of you getting coffee. So it doesn't really work. So what we need to do is be able to go in the water with the animals. And so uh, we utilize these biologging tags. And this one, the one in the bottom um, is called a, this is a camera tag. And so it's got 12 different channels of, of, of data capabilities, accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, depth, temperature, all sorts of great things that we can recreate the movements and dynamics of the animal. But one of the things, the, the part that I want to talk about today is the camera component. And that allows us to see how the animal is interacting with its environment, with its conspecifics, and with its prey. And so the way this works is that the, the tag itself clamps onto the dorsal fin of the shark as it swims by. And the, the goal of this is to be able to start recording the natural behaviors at the moment that it goes on. So you see it swims up, I clamp it on, um, and the shark goes on its way. That one's a little bit bigger. That was a prototype tag that we were um, doing some other work on. So normally they're a lot smaller than that. So from that tag, we can start to go underwater with the animals and see what they're seeing and how they're interacting. And historically, um, are any of you guys divers? Have you heard the, the same that, that um, that sharks don't like to go into kelp. <laughs> so one of the things was uh, there was this idea that these, these big predators wanted to stay out of the kelp. They didn't want to be, I guess, bothered by all the stuff rubbing on their sides. Um, and we put a camera on some sharks uh, in South Africa and found out that, um, much to 
our amazement that they actually utilize the kelp to hunt in a very different strategy than what we'd understood before. So you'll see some seals on the bottom um, blowing bubbles at the shark. And so the shark is, is pursuing the seals within the kelp habitat, um, pushing through. And uh, they're actually doing a very different behavior where they, they almost corral the seals into the kelp. Um, and then the seals will collect and go to the top of the water column. And once the seals are distracted, they're breathing or whatever, the sharks will pursue them. So you'll see the shark will come down um, and come up here. And there's some seals. Oh, it's very quick. I'll show you in a sec. Um, there's some seals in, actually in, uh, in the kelp that they've corralled. So there's three seals here, one, two, three. Uh, and this is just a breakdown of some of those, um, some of the, 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 the snips that we get from the sharks. So they see their prey. The seals are hunkering down at the bottom, blowing bubbles. The sharks are swimming through the bubbles. And then they're pursuing uh, the seals inside the kelp. And it turns out if we looked at the, 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 a, a longer scale of the video, so this is time, um, the hours of, of footage on the, on the x-axis here, and then different individuals. And the colors uh, coincide. The, I guess it's light blue, maybe? Light blue is low kelp uh, in the field of view, and then green is high kelp. And so you see that that kelp environment for these eight sharks that we tagged at the island um, constitute a really big portion of their hunting time. And in fact, if we do a pseudoplot, so we took a five minute break of one of those, um, one of those sharks and um, plotted it out using the, the accelerometers and the magnetometers, that it spent a majority of that five minutes within the kelp. So the black line is the track, the green is inside kelp. Um, and all of the interactions with seals were in the kelp. And we actually, all five, or sorry, all eight of these different um, sharks that we tagged, the only time the animals saw, saw seals were in the kelp. So it's a very different hunting strategy than we thought. What, what is the contact represent? What's that? The contact. So this contact is when it's actually, it's, it's directly swimming through the kelp. It's not contact with the seal. It's when it's actually has the, has the basically, when you, and you, when you saw in the video as it's got the kelp sort of draping over it. That's the contact. So we, we, um, we wanted to score it based on the, the thickness of the kelp, or it's, it's how, how deep into the kelp it was, whether it could see it or whether it was like swimming around it or whether it was actually in it. And this has a, a really interesting um, consequence for, for humans. And so I'm sure Mark is familiar with this, is that there are a, a lot of abalone uh, around Dyer Island. And for some of, the, um, some of the local communities, poaching abalone is a very marketable um, income source. And so the, 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 some of the community members will go, to, go out to the beach at night. Uh, and it's about a little over a little over two, somewhere between two and three kilometers from the beach to the island, and they'll swim that distance at night, um, and they will stop in the kelp paddies in order to rest and, and seek refuge. Or the idea is they get refuge in those kelp paddies, and then they continue to swim out, poach their abalone, and then they swim back. What we know is that the sharks are actually hunting in those paddies, so it, it creates a conflict. So people think that they're actually they're they're finding some type of of safety within those kelp, but it's actually the spot that the white sharks are hunting in. So they're doing this very different hunting strategy. Um, and we have about 450 hours, of, um, 450 hours of video from South Africa, Cape Cod, and California. But during that entire time, all of that 150 hours, even though the animals are seen, uh, the sharks are seen prey, we have only evidence from, of one predation during that entire time, which is pretty incredible. And I will show you this predation. So you can see the top of the head of the shark here, and a hagfish. <laughs> That's it. So this big, terrifying marine apex predator just ate a hagfish. It was great. I, did, I, I gave a talk at a conference and told them this is the world premiere of this. And uh, I think everybody was really excited, and then it was incredibly anticlimactic. It was, it was great. Um, so an, another technique that we had is, so that's the, the camera tag that goes, and we can see when these predation events happen. But now we wanted to, is there another way to look at predation, figure out when that's happening? Perhaps there's something about the tag that's um, changing the behavior of the shark, so they're not predating. Or um, 
they're filling up on hagfish at night and we couldn't see it or something. <laughs> so um, we have another technology called a stomach tag. And basically this is a, that has a diary in it, the same as the camera tag with these, these biologging sensors. It's got depth and temperature. And we feed it to the animal. So we wrap it into um, a little piece of blubber. And so it's on the, on the top right here. It's, you can see that's a, a piece of elephant seal blubber. We wrap it up uh, in what we call a, um, a blubber burrito. <laughs> and we put it in the water and offer it to the shark. And so in California, we're using a decoy. And so we'll tie this blubber off the, this blubber burrito off the back of the decoy. And when a shark comes up to bite the decoy, we pull in a little bit and then it'll grab on to that, to that blubber and then it'll consume it. This is a, get this quick video to play. You'll see this is, uh, this is actually Mr. Burns, that same shark that we saw before. So he comes up, he grabs it and he swims away. And he'll keep that, that tag in his stomach for anywhere from a few days uh, to a few weeks. And sharks, because they eat a lot of, um, uh, of indigestible bits, bones and things like that, they naturally will regurgitate their stomach at some point. So what will happen is in you know, a few days or two weeks or whatever that Mr. Burns will um, regurgitate all the contents of the stomach, that tag will come up, float up, and we'll go out and pick it up. And from that we can look at the, 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 the temperature data, which is, a, which is the key to understanding their, the foraging ecology using this type of tag. Um, and as I said, white sharks are these regional endotherms, so their, their stomachs are warm. Um, and so when they are swimming around in a cold ocean, they open their mouth, they ingest a bunch of cold water. So you'll see the, the temperature in the tag drop. The cool thing though is that you can, you can look at the increase of the temperature to give you an idea if that was actually successful or not. So the same way that on Thanksgiving dinner you eat a bunch of food, you sit back and you sort of unbuckle your, your belt and then you just you have that like, like warm rush that your body is just, just, just digesting all this food. White sharks are sort of the same. I don't know that they unbuckle their belt, but they have that same sort of, we call it a, the heat increment of feeding. So as, you're, as the, they warm up the cold water that's in their stomach, they would, if it was an unsuccessful attempt, their body temperature would go back to their resting temperature, which is about 24 degrees Celsius. But if it's a successful event, that the um, digestion of that food is going to continue to raise this, the temperature of their stomach somewhere up to 25, 26, 27 degrees. So if we look through the temperature record on these tags, and we see a big cold, cold influx, and then we look at how the temperature changes after that, we can determine if it had or had successful or unsuccessful feeding events, or if it was yawning or gulping or doing something else. And so this is, this is an example of, of a feeding event. So you can see when the tag goes, um, is, is, goes in the shark here at the very beginning at time zero, uh, and on the left is the, the stomach temperature at time zero, that's when the cold water comes in with the tag, it gets inside the shark's stomach. And you can see this elevated temperature goes up to about 26 degrees. And that's during that digestion, digestion process. And it starts to drop down. So you have that heat increment of feeding um, between the high temperature of digestion back to its, its, its um, like resting metabolic rate. And a few days, five days later, there's another big drop in temperature. Um, and then you see another of these heat increments of feeding. So this original one was the, was the blubber burrito that it was digesting. Five days later, another cold water in, um, pulse, and then another big heat increment. So we can see that that was a successful feeding, uh, feeding <coughs> event for that shark. So now we have this way to find successful feeding events. We have a lot of evidence of, of unsuccessful ones where it's cold water in pulses um, and then goes back to just that, that resting metabolic temperature. Um, but out of about a thousand hours of stomach tag video, again, or stomach tag data, again, only one predation, only one successful event in that entire time. And which is pretty incredible because one of the sharks that, that um, with that big period of time without, um, without a feeding event was that same shark. It was a different year, but that same shark, Mr. Burns, I showed before, that grew his, his body condition, increased massively over a few weeks. So he's obviously feeding, just not feeding very often. Um, and, in, and it's not because they're not interacting with their prey. We know that their prey are available. So from the video, we took the, the interactions of the sharks with different prey sources, um, marine mammals, birds, and fish. And so they're seeing these, these, these potential prey, um, but they're really very rarely eating them. 
So that's a little bit about their foraging ecology. Another aspect of, of that we found was really interesting is looking at intraguild interactions, intraguild intra predation. Um, and basically what it is is that, uh, if, if you're not familiar, uh, an intraguild interaction is when two animals basically fill the same ecological niche. And there's some type of, of, of overlap um, that causes them to interact. And uh, we were looking at white sharks and trying to understand how they were interacting with the other big predators um, that they overlap with. And so this is some work that we did in California, uh, and it's mostly uh, centered around the Farallon Islands. Um, so again, that's the, that's the island that's about 25 miles off of, um, off of San Francisco. And so with these animals, we put acoustic tags on them, which is circled in red on the shark there. Um, and these are, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with these tags. They send out a, an acoustic signal um, that goes about somewhere between half a mile and, and three quarters, sorry, half a kilometer to three quarters of a kilometer um, that says I'm animal 57 and I'm here and it'll send that every few minutes. And you have to have a base station that's listening for it. So if you all saw Sarah's talk uh, a few weeks ago, she was using the same thing on, uh, on Dungeons Crab. Um, and I'm sure many of you have used them on salmon and rockfish and basically everything else. And so uh, we have the receivers at our, the, the three study locations we have at Tamales, the Farallons, and Anyo. And these are the data that we got back. So you see that the sharks are, they're present. So it's time along the, the x-axis and detections per day along the y. Um, and you can see that, that the sharks are peaking in their, in their residency along the coast basically from August to March every year. And the colors are just the different cohorts of, of tags that we put out. So you can see sort of the attrition of the tags. But there are these very predictable periods of time when they're along the coast. And that is a time that they overlap um, both with their prey and with a potential uh, competitor or predator. Uh, so in the purple, um, you see that's the elephant seal, so that's their prey species. And so if you look at the top left in that figure, that's the frequency uh, of elephant seals during weekly, weekly elephant seal abundance counts at Farallon Island. So you see there's two peaks. Um, there's a peak in um, basically April, May, and then another peak in the fall in October, November. And that coincides really well with the peak of white sharks, which is the, in the green, with their, their coastal, um, uh, I guess, coastal residency, which is that same October, November time. That also happens to coincide with one of the um, periods of time when killer whales are present uh, in that same region. And so the, the bottom left figure is, um, is the average uh, monthly sightings of, um, uh, of orcas it's, uh, at the Farallon Islands. And so many of you are probably familiar with, since um, orcas are a, a, a big thing here, um, that there's three different ecotypes in our region. And there's the offshores, um, there's the, the uh, resident, and the transient killer whales. And they, have, they all have very different um, uh, morphologies, and that's because they, and they focus on different types of prey species. So your, your residents are the, the type of feeding on, on fish, transients are feeding on marine mammals, and then the offshores are focused on elasmobranchs. And you can also see that from the, their dentition, for example. The offshores have very worn down cusps, and that's from the abrasive skin of um, the sleeper sharks, which are a big, uh, a big portion of their diets. <clears throat> so the Farallons have a, um, they have a, a lighthouse in, in the top of it, and every day um, when the weather conditions allow, there's someone up there uh, doing surveys for marine mammals, for both any marine mammals that are swimming around, uh, and also for um, predations by sharks on marine mammals. So if an elephant seal gets killed, there's a big plume of, of blood in the water, um, and they note that down. So they can see when, it, when the seal, or sorry, they can see when the, um, uh, when the killer whales come in and they can tell a general idea about the distance they are from the islands. That same time that, that they're out there watching the, for the um, predations and for um, the orcas, our receivers are in the water listening. So the, the, um, the gray is the island, the little star in the middle is where that, um, where that lighthouse is, and then the orange circles are where we have receivers for those acoustic tags. So there's a, there's uh, observers up at the top of the lighthouse looking down, counting the number of shark attacks on elephant seals. They're counting the distance and number and timing of killer whales coming in. 
um, within 15 kilometers of the island. And at the same time, the R receivers are detecting how many white sharks or which white sharks are swimming around. And so on a typical year um, from about uh, mid-September through mid-November, there's a pretty consistent schedule of attacks. There's about, on average, about 40 um, predation events of white sharks on marine mammals, on, on elephant seals um, at the Fairland Islands. It's, it's, and it's been that way for um, the past, uh, I think, probably about 20 years. And this is a, a figure of um, the detections of white sharks um, per day over the August to March period. And the different colors are the different locations uh, of the receivers. So the orange and yellow is the Farallon Islands. Uh, blue in this is Anunuevo. And then green and purple are Tomales Point. So those are the three locations. And you can see this is the, the very typical um, distribution of or residency of sharks at these locations. And so you can see that the, at the Farallons, it, it, the animals come up and they sort of peak. The number of, of animals detected per day peaks in sort of October, November. Uh, and starts to trail off. Um, it's a pretty, uh, a pretty symmetrical, uh, symmetrical curve. 18 out of, um, let's see, 18 out of 2,000 survey days, so over about the past 25 years, um, orcas have been seen within 50 miles of the island at the same time that white sharks were there. And one of those occasions uh, was 2009. Um, this is when orcas came up to within a few miles of the island, and this is the detections, the actual detection data from that time. And we see that the, the, the day that the orcas showed up, within seven and a half hours of, of the orcas coming into the island, every shark left. So 17 animals that had been around um, for the preceding months left that day. Some of them were displaced and went to Ani Nuevo, and other of, the, other of them just moved away. And this is a, a different way to look at it. This is an abacus plot. So this is, this is time. Um, so this is zero is when the killer whale showed up. And then on the uh, y-axis is the shark ID. So those are the 17 sharks that were there. You can see they were there fairly consistently up until that moment. The, the orcas came in for about two hours, uh, killed, two, killed three uh, marine mammals. Um, we don't know if they interacted with the sharks at all, but all of the sharks left. What's really interesting about this um, is that, so if you look at the what would be number 18 up here, um, 18 comes in, wasn't here at all, wasn't at, at the island at all, but came in a, uh, a few days later and left. The average residency time at the Fairlands is 35 days. So on normal, a shark would come in and hang out for 35 days, eat and do everything and leave. That shark came in for, I think it was seven minutes. <laughs> um, this shark was there for 18 hours and left. This shark, uh, shark 17, was there, um, obviously, when the event happened, left, came back for um, something like it was detected three times, and then it left as well. So, and, they, uh, and they got displaced, and so they went to different places. Like, so the, these animals went to the blue here is, is Anya Nueva. So they got displaced to other locations um, where populations or different groups of white sharks have been. So one, you are um, not allowing them to feed at this prime hunting ground that they have been sitting at for the last three weeks or four weeks. And then they're going to these other places that already have uh, an, a, an aggregation of sharks feeding. So you're putting extra pressure and extra competition at those locations. And this isn't something that was a, a one-off. It turns out that this has happened a number of times. And so in 2013 and in 2011, very similar um, occurrences happened where you had uh, a number of white sharks that were there. And then um, in 2013, the day that orcas arrived, all the sharks left. 2011, uh, unfortunately, it was really bad weather that day, so they don't have any observations. But we assume that probably, again, it was orcas coming in um, and displacing those sharks. And, and so we don't have any evidence at these times if there was actually a direct predation of a white sh on a white shark by a killer whale. In 1997, there was, but that was before we had these receivers in. Um, but in 1997, the basically after the orcas came through, they they killed a white shark that ate its liver. Um, there were only two uh, predations by white sharks on marine mammals for the rest of the season. Um, normally, there's about one per day. 
Um, so it's pretty good evidence that, that that was a direct competition resulted in mortality of an animal and displacement of all those sharks. We keep seeing evidence of this happening. And so there's, a, there's an effect for the white sharks. There's a, a competitive effect. Um, there is uh, likely some type of fitness effect because now they're, they're away from their prime hunting ground. They have to go somewhere else and then they have to compete um, with other white sharks for uh, resources or for space or whatever it is at these other hunting grounds. But there's also a consequence, um, a trophic consequence beyond them. So this is a figure of the mean fall seal count on the x-axis and then the predation rate, um, the number per hour on the y-axis. And um, the black line in the middle is, um, is the fit to, to those data. And uh, if you look all of the, the numbers, so the 2009, 2011, 13, 97, um, those are years that there were orcas sighted within 15 miles, sorry, 15 kilometers of the Fairlands. In um, the time that we saw either a decrease um, in the number of tagged animals or in 1997, the year that we actually saw a white shark being, being killed. You'll notice that the, those are all well below that, that mean line. Um, so what we're seeing is that there is a decrease in the, the predation pressure on marine mammals, on the elephant seals, when the sharks are displaced. And if you look at 2000 and 2011, those were years that the, the orcas came in very late in the season. And that's why we think that they're still sort of in the, the regular range of predations per hour, um, because they, those didn't occur until late uh, I guess late, mid to late November, um, and that means that basically white sharks had already, their, their normal predation, they'd probably, you know, eaten 36 or 37 elephant seals by that point. So once they got displaced, um, there wasn't as much of an effect on the, on the predation rate. So just to be clear, yes. the predations per hour, does that include the predations by orcas that might have been seen, or that so, the white sharks. so that's just the white sharks, but the orcas, when they come in, they only come in for anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours. And there's only been um, only five, uh, I want to say, say it was only sea lions, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's only, well, I'll just say marine mammals, only five marine mammals were killed in three instances by the orcas. So it's not, they're not they don't have a huge predation rate on the marine mammals there. Um, and that's based on the same observation. Based on the observation, you know, yeah. Yeah. That, and they're using big eyes, I suppose. There you, there's a couple different, um, they have some theodolites and a bunch of different things that they use to, to, um, to look at them. The thing about the predation is that it's, um, even if you don't see it happen, you, it's, it's really evident there because the oils will slick off the water. So even if it's a subsurface, um, you usually have a pretty good, um, you know, pretty good idea that it happens. That would depend somewhat on the ambient conditions in terms of wind speed, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. I yep. imagine. Yep, yep, it would. But the, the, um, the orcas are also not there very long. So it's a very short period of time. Um, and they basically, they track them as they're coming in and track them as they're going out. So they're watching basically that whole, the, the whole um, scene play out. So you're seeing the, the seals or sea lions coming in, you're seeing the, 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 the killer whales coming in as well. So it's a, that's a, I think it's a, a, probably a very close estimate to how many animals that were actually consumed or killed by, um, by the orcas. Thanks for the clarification. And these are transients? So, thank you, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So um, on, let's see, in 90, 97, the, the, it was transients that killed um, the white shark, and then it was 2009, there were transients and offshores at the same time, but all of the other ones have just been transients. But 97 was a cow and a calf. Yeah. And, and after the big female spotted the white shark, it made a beeline for it, normal swimming, made a beeline, hit, hit it, Dismember that she had a calf. Yep. Calf came along. She tore it up. Yep. Pulled it out and then fed it to the, the calf. Yep. So it makes you wonder if it well, also wasn't training as well. I mean, it was opportunistic. Yeah. You know, well, and that's and so and this 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 similar um, uh, 
sort of uh, intrigue predation is, is happened in South Africa recently, um, and the, the the orcas are basically eating the uh, eating the liver, that really fatty, rich, energy rich part of the white sharks, and they're not consuming all of it; they're just eating the liver, um, which is really interesting. And they they actually will flip the shark over. Sharks go into tonic mobility. Basically, they fall asleep when they get flipped over. So the, the, the killer whales know to do that, turn them over, and then they can drown them, basically, by, by holding them still. So, it, yeah. you know, it's... it's they were um, just eviscerating. Because yeah. They were opening up their, their bellies. And yeah. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's a pretty incredible behavior to have learned and to, you know, to be passing on. Um, I'm, Imagine if all of them did it. Yeah. That would be a well, that's, that's the problem in South Africa that, that they're having is that... Um, basically, the, there's a there's two killer whales that are coming through. They have they have opposing flopped over fins. One is called starboard, and the other is called port. Um, <laughs> and they have just been coming in and just wiping out entire bays worth of it was white sharks, and then it was um, seven gills. Seven gills. Yeah. yeah, and now um, it, so it's it's really a, a really interesting interaction that they're that they're developing or learning or. You know, it's because there it's a new thing. Um, so, um, so that's a little bit about about these coastal behaviors in in foraging ecology and things that we're we're starting to or that we've we've started to look at. And now I wanted to to, to branch into the, the types of really interesting questions that I want to start asking here um, because we're we're basically building. I want to build off of what we've learned at these other places. And so we know that the white sharks occur here. Um, these are the left is satellite tag data from uh, from sharks that that our team tagged down in California. Um, and you can see the animals coming uh, in, in this one as far as um, sort of the middle of Oregon. And some tracks go all the way up uh, into Washington. We know that in El Nino years, sharks have been uh, caught as far north as Alaska. Uh, and on the right side is some of the acoustic data, uh, and the size of the gray the gray circles is. Um, basically the number of detections of those sites. And you see there's a lot of them that, that center around Central California. Um, but as you go north, they've been picked up off Port Orford and further up. And these are on different receivers. Other folks are listening to um, uh, you know, rockfish. Or, or if you saw Sarah's talk a few weeks ago, she had a bunch of, of sharks that I had tagged in California showed up on her um, array for the, uh, for the Dungeness crab. So we know that they're, they're here. Um, in fact, uh, a week and a week and a half ago, um, Jim gave me a call and said that there was a uh, a whale on the beach, um, and I took some some the next generation of budding scientists down, <laughs> pulled them out of school uh, to come down on a blistery day to see it. And on this animal, uh, let's see. Well, you're gonna have to hear the wind anyway. Um, so uh, I counted at least 48 distinct bites on this animal. The one that we just passed was about 24 inches wide. Um, and so that's the, not the work of a single animal, but the work of a, uh, a number of animals. So it's pretty incredible that this time of year that there's still a good number of white sharks um, that have been off feeding on this marine mammal, or sorry, on this uh, sperm whale. And we also know that with the changing climate, that water temperatures are warming. And so this is a really nice paper that um, White et al. did that looks at the available thermal niche for juvenile white sharks. So we talked about it before that the, the young ones have this, don't have a whole lot of thermal inertia, so they have to stay in warm water, so they're thermally limited. And as time goes along, so on the, um, the y-axis is the median latitude, basically, that they're able to access. Um, and going through time on the x-axis. So you can see these, these pulses. And as we go through time from basically 2010 to 2015, you see that the, that the, um, the animals are able to exploit a niche further and further north. And so this is the juveniles. And in fact, that's what we've, we've seen in the actual, um, in the actual data is that uh, in real time, the animals are normally down here in the Southern California Bight. And now we've recently seen that, that since 2015, there has been um, an occurrence of these normally um, temperature limited uh, young of the year and juvenile sharks in Monterey Bay. So if you go out of Santa Cruz in the summer, this is what you can see now. This, this wasn't an occurrence before. We had, I think there was a, a record of just a few um, young of the year white sharks ever showing up in Monterey Bay. Uh, and now you can go out and um, this is some colleagues from the aquarium out to tag them. 
uh, but you can go out, put a drone up, and see four to five sharks swimming around at any time. So their niche is expanding north as water temperatures are expanding as well. So the question is, what are the adults doing? Are, is that their available niche also thermally limited, and are they, are they going to start moving further north in bigger numbers? And we know that there's plenty of things for them to eat here. And so if it is just the thermal um, barriers that keeping them sort of in the central California area, that as the water's warm, we expect to see them to start moving up. And so that's one of the things I want to look at, how they're going to expand their range into this region more. And the other area is looking at how they're utilizing uh, these coastal ecosystems. And so this is a, a figure of a, a, of a shark I tagged a few years ago um, in Central California where the square is. And you can see it goes down to the Channel Islands offshore and then comes back to the coast. But what I want you to focus in on is uh, the section at the top where it's in purple. Um, and again, these are satellite tag data, so there's some error associated with the location. But any of you know where this is? Where these purple dots are clustering? It's the Klamath. So that is right, right at the outlet of the Klamath. What's crazy about this tag is that the tag has depth, temperature, and light level on it. This shark spent um, four or five days in very dark water, very cold water, and very shallow water. So it suggested that animal was actually inside the mouth of the Klamath. So it got itself up inside. So it wasn't. It was no longer in the in the in the seawater on the outside, but it actually gone inside the Klamath. So what are these animals doing? How are they going to start utilizing? the ecosystems that are available to them here that are different than California. So that's the other type of question that I'm going to start asking uh, about the sharks that we have here. Um, and with that, that's it. I'd like to say thanks. Um, I'm happy to take questions. If anybody has any questions. So the, um, as the young shark matures, yep. is it the development of the like the cross current circulation counter heat counter current yes. heat exchangers. I couldn't even say that. Yeah. But yes, <laughs> I couldn't either. Apparently, <laughs> but th that's that's what's keeping them from immediately being able to raise their surface temperature, or is it body mass? Because you were saying I think it's body mass. mass. Yeah, because they they have those counter current heat exchangers at, at birth, but they're it's their basically their thermal inertia that's allowing them. Those are really good for um, for some some temperature regulation, but I think when you get to, when you're talking about an animal that's that's this big around, um, that's very different than an animal that's, you know, a, a, I guess when they hit about three, they're probably about this big around when they hit yeah. about two and a half. You know, uh, thermal around. mass. Yeah, yeah, they got a lot of thermal mass. Sort of like, you know, us after the holidays. <laughs> so that uh, displacement by orchids is pretty striking. I wonder if you yeah, I have no idea, and that's the it's so. I mean, there's a lot of questions that go into all of that. Is is um, what's the you know if 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 there is direct predation pressure on a white shark from a from an orca, then you can say yeah, that makes sense that they're going to leave and and be done with it. But um, if it's you wonder if they're just getting if they're just getting um, pushed out. Why they uh, and, and not directly predated on why they would stay away. How they stay away. How those animals. So it was about seven and a half hours from the time that the, the orcas came in to when all of the sharks were gone. And so how that information in that island is say like a square mile or square kilometer. Um, in and the sharks are on all sides of it, and they have to be able to within that seven and a half hours somehow figure out that the Orcas are there, and they all leave, even though the orcas were only there for a couple hours. So even after the after the killer whales left, there were still sharks there, but then they st they they moved out. Um, and then we have a couple ideas about the why the sharks that came in later on left again. Um, and we call that one the uh, we call it the what is it? It's the empty restaurant hypothesis. Yeah. So you 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 go into it. You 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 pull into a. a a parking lot and there's two restaurants and there's one that's full of people, there's one that has nobody in it, you're definitely not going to the one that's empty, right? You're going to go to the one that has all the other people in it. 
So we think that that may be it, and there may be other mechanisms that do it too. I'm happy if anybody has some ideas. But yeah, there's all sorts of questions that that, that, that raises. Yes? Um, I don't know. Uh, so the, the, the thing about the, the elephant seals that are the main prey source of the white sharks is that they are, um, they're limited by haul out space. And so the, the, basically the Fairlands is, has steep sides and the only place that they can access are these sort of wash, these like washway chutes. So the sea lions can climb up, they get all over the place. The elephant seals are really limited. So at high tide, they're all getting washed out anyway. So they can't, there's no way that they can, even if they're terrified that there's killer whales there, there's no way that they can hunker down because they get washed out during those high tides and things anyway. I don't know if that was... Yeah. Uh, no, so that, that's what the, so the elephant seal counts um, are consistent over that, over that period of time. So there isn't a big drop in the, uh, in the elephant seals. And the, you know, the Again, the, the killer whales are only there for a very brief period, you know, for a few minutes to a few hours. So there isn't a, um, like a lasting, for them at least, a lasting sort of like um, signal to leave or, or reason to leave, I guess. Yes? Thanks for sharing the video of uh, what, it's, what it's like to ride on a dorsal fin of a gray. It's <laughs> really awesome. Thank and, you. Uh, Sharks don't go into kelp beds. It just reminded me of just another dumb human rationalization. <laughs> and it made me think of Gary Larson would have a great time. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I would. So um, Sherman's Lagoon is. Uh, what's that? Yeah, to me. So he it's great um, and that has done a number of, of different cartoons with some of the tags and things um, about the marine census and things. I, I, I'm gonna have to send him uh, the paper and see if I can get him to, to do a something funny about that. And this is the same data that uh, was shared with Susan Casey and with Devil's Keep, or if a lot of this was familiar. Um, it, it, yes and no. That 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 book was pretty catastrophic to the research. We actually got our permits yanked. We got kicked off the island. All sorts of stuff because of that book. Um, but yeah, it's it did start at the. It's been a continuation of that same, this is a continuation of that same project that um, she did talk about back then. Yes? So the predation or, or consumption of uh, whales, I, I many years ago saw a video of white sharks eating a, a gray whale. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you think it's opportunistic? Or are they actually killing it or the sperm whale? Is that the... Opportunistic. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that they would be able to or want to try to take down a, a whale. Like if you go into South Africa, the the, the right whales are in there um, breeding and they're just, you know, they're, they're swimming amongst each other and you go to the Fairlands and the same thing, they're swimming all. I, I, I don't see any, I've never seen any indication that there's there's that type of interaction with, with the, the, the two species. But I think, yeah, it's mostly opportunistic. Yeah, Bruce. Uh, back in the early part of tagging, uh, they had the acoustic aspect where they could monitor and they were putting transmitters in, I think it was half a sheet at a time, on various buoys around the Farallons. And they'd go for what I understood to be four or five days without it. And all of a sudden they'd be, this one would go and then another one. And they documented that a lot of those were going into the same shark. Hmm. Suggesting that it was uh, a sort of feeding origin. We just well, turned on that one. Yeah, I had a term for it. I don't remember what it was now. Uh, but it was you know, a lot of food at one time. And you showed individual feeding events with a lot of temperature change in the stomach. Have you ever seen any evidence of, of uh, a large amount of feeding of, of various incidences one after another? No, I mean, those are the, those are the only data that we have of feeding events at all from, from, from tag data. I mean, we you'll see... A predation, and uh, a, and it's different depending on the situation. But you you sometimes see one shark that will hit a seal or sea lion. Um, and the nice thing about elephant seals is that they float as soon as they're dead. Um, and so you'll see that same shark come up and consume basically 
bit after bit after bit of that animal and, take, and consume basically the whole elephant seal. Um, and other times you'll see a shark take a bite out of it and then another shark will come out and take another bite out of it. And it, so it's like, it's like a hierarchical thing where one goes and then the next one and then the next one. So it's, it's very different. But I don't know that we've seen... Um, I, I don't think we have any way or have any data that would um, that would speak to that at all. I do know that. Yeah, where they're just like they're they're like I need to eat. I'm just going to go eat everything. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'll have to I'll have to look into that because I, I hadn't heard of that, but um, I knew they did a lot of really interesting at the Fairlawns back in the day. Well, they were smaller, Alan Yeah. Um, great presentation. Thank you. I have another question. Um, kind of is it an easy one? It's a little different than you know, <laughs> maybe uh, some speculation sort of thing. I've heard from a number of folks um, that uh, you know there's a lot of interest in sea otters and sea otters you know moving to uh, you know here and some talk about a limitation for the southern um, group of sea otters being this shark. You know, uh, area yep. that is you know right in the area that you're looking at there, and uh, you know, so I'm just going to what, what's your take on that? Um, did Tim Tinker talk to about it when he was here? Did he talk about I don't the? Think he went to that. Okay. He talked Could, a little bit about it. I've heard it from a, a number of other folks. Yeah. As well. um, Lillian, I can't remember her last name. Who works with Sea Otters. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I mean, I pers I don't think it's a, that the white sharks are a limiting factor on the the sea. If that's what you're asking, if if they're they're, if they're, they're they're suggesting that because there are so many sharks there, that that's a that's a real limitation to sea otters moving north from California up to northern California and up into Oregon. That was the theory. That yeah, I guess I don't. I don't necessarily I follow that be because. Yeah, um, just because they, you know, they're already sea otters are um, doing really well in places that have a lot of sharks already. So basically, the whole Southern California bite up and through Monterey, like this whole Southern California bite, you have tons of the juveniles and young of the year that are are are. I guess it's the juveniles that are learning how to hunt, and so they're the ones that are practicing on all sorts of things, which I think has led to a, a lot of. Uh, of otter strikes and, uh, and otter kills, um, but as you go, you know, in, up in the Monterey Bay and all those areas, there's t there's a lot of white sharks. There's a lot of a lot of predators that that would be that would be limiting the the, the otters. But it's it, I don't think that I don't think that we necessarily see that at least from 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 my understanding. So because you look at all the knee crops over time, there's, there isn't any remains of otter in white shark sites. But you get individual otters that get hit. Mm -hmm. And the mortalities on those are usually septicemia secondary for animals that um, took a hit to the peritoneum or something. I looked at uh, South African penguins getting mm -hmm. grabbed and bounced yep. at Dyer and saw the same thing. It almost paralleled what we Slow with, with the otters here. With the otters. They're not consuming yeah. them, but they'll hit them and they're hitting them very controlled because you're getting individual puncture wounds. Mm -hmm. So like the penguins, we, there was like a 12.2 mortality of penguins that were hit by white sharks. And of those, the majority that, that were mortal took a single puncture wound in the trachea or one in the abdominal area. Yeah, so very, very rarely, those things are very rarely consumed. But it does that, that still is pressure on them, right? Even if they're they're not consumed, it still is, yeah, it still is it some type of... Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, from my take on what you guys are saying is that you don't believe that it would be a limiting factor. Yeah, I don't, but then that's, again, that's that's yeah, my that's my opinion. I don't, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't back that up with a yeah, bunch of data, yeah. so that's totally conjecture on my I know part. it was a speculation <laughs> question, so, yeah. Yes? reason large whales migrate to the tropics is to molt their skin, not for breeding and not for mm -hmm. eating. Uh, what's known about shark skin mold? Wow, I have no idea. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I'm gonna lie. So I mean, they, so they have denticles. So um, you know, modified, basically modified teeth. Um, but I don't know anything about shed rates. I'm not not sure. I'm not sure anyone's really looked at that. Um, I guess I'm going to now. <laughs> The blubber, so um, from stranded animals, so um, like the like the that sperm well that was washed up um, in California, we have permits to collect. Um, or the marine, actually, the marine mammal center does most of it for us down there. Well, they'll they'll just flend some some skin off or some blubber off a elephant seal. Actually, we had one elephant seal that got hit by a car in Cambria, and so we got that one and um, all sorts of weird stuff that happens. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are, and I cannot remember them offhand. Um, but but there 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 are. And um, are transients the ones that go quiet when they hunt? Yes. Okay. No, the uh, the, the uh, yeah the transients, transients. go off. The go so quiet. I mean that's that's one thing. So that they have the lateral line in. I mean they have two structures to pick up vibration in front of the water. They they. They have different frequencies for that. Yeah, but it, it would be really hard to, sound-wise, it would be really hard to pick pick up the, the sound on the opposite side of the island, right. um, especially if those if those orcas had gone into like silent hunt mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't remember if it's I can't remember if it's in the same in the same frequency hearing frequency the sharks. I did know that once. Like everything else, it's just gone. We flyovers at Dyer, and we were, this is what I was talking about, we were working with the dolphin recorders. And we, uh, we were seeing that sharks would respond to bottlenose and orca vocalizations to about two kilometers. Some, within that one kilometer, almost every shark picked it up, and you would see it effectively change mm -hmm. towards okay. the source. But beyond that, it got sketchier. Yep. So it did you, did, like you, did you try it with a different a, a different sound though? That was it just the sound that was throwing them off, or was it? Um, good good question. So you know, I mean, they but they responded differently to to the bottlenose dolphins than they did the orcas. And you saw that, especially when we did it close around the boat, you could actually see the behavior so change. Yeah. One was more like a searching pattern for feeding. The other one was, I don't know. How to explain it? It, it, it looked like anxious yeah. swimming behavior. Be more aware or something. Like that. Not where's my food, but where's the yeah. thing that wants to eat yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. So I know that Taylor actually has another presentation he has to get to, believe it or not. So if we can make... a different one if everybody wants to go. <laughs> I want to say thank you. Tuesday, and if not, next Thursday. Thank you, everybody. Take care, Mark. Uh,